And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everyone, it's Ryan Metzler here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game about dinosaurs. As a matter of fact, it's called The Age of Dinosaurs. Uh, this is a game for two to four players, actually three to four players. Uh, I guess it doesn't really work without three, but three to four players by Michael Jaworski Games. Uh, and it's kind of a game about moving about dinosaurs, feeding your dinosaurs, breeding, uh, hunting, and generally just trying to survive. The first player to get 40 points worth of dinosaurs onto the board is going to win. So now that I've given you a brief introduction about what the game is, why don't we take a look at how it plays, and then I'll give you what my thoughts are on it. So here you can see the board for Age of Dinosaurs completely set up, and each one of those triangles is going to represent a different type of terrain on the board. So you can see that there are forests in green, there are deserts in kind of a tannish color, there are fields in a lighter green, and then it's hard to see but there are swamps which are also green kind of like the forests. Each of the counters on the board is going to represent a different type of food. Green counters will represent trees, while yellow counters will represent ferns, and those are going to be on tracks that are on each of the different triangles, representing how much of that food source is there. Later in the game, different types of counters will come out. that will be red counters and black counters, which will represent kills, which will be a food for some types of dinosaurs, and carcasses, which will be foods for other types of dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are going to be represented by player pieces and stands, but for convenience I'm going to show you what all of the dinosaurs are like here on this handy player sheet. You can see that we have the different names of the dinosaurs along the left uh, in the columns here, and then you can see that their point, what their point values are right next to that. So the Oviraptor is worth one point, where something like a Spinosaurus is worth three points. And this is going to be how you judge how many points they're worth for victory, as well as how many points worth of dinosaurs you put out at the beginning of the game. Next to that, you can see the types of terrains that they can survive and move on, and then what types of foods that they're going to need. So oviraptors, for example, if we get a little closer, can either eat trees or carcasses, whereas the velociraptor needs to eat kills, and something more like the protoceratops needs to eat either trees or ferns. This is going to dictate what types of food they'll need each turn in order to survive. The numbers next to that are going to represent their fight values and speed values, which will represent how well they can either attack other dinosaurs or survive against attacks from other dinosaurs, and how quickly they may move, and how quickly they may run away from dinosaurs trying to kill them. At the start of the game, each player is going to place 10 points worth of dinosaurs onto the board, and as I said, those points are printed right on the dinosaurs. Each player gets 10 so that it's evenly balanced at the beginning of the game. On each turn, players are going to start, and they're going to go through the same pattern of events. First, they're going to roll two dice, and the dice total on that die will determine which ones of the different types of terrains out here will produce more food. So in this case, I rolled a seven, which can be seen here, and I would look for the sevens on here, and I would advance their food markers by one for each type of food on there. If the dice happen to total either two or twelve, bad things will happen on the board. If the dice total two, or total two, a natural disaster will happen in the swamp, and all of the fern counters will be set to zero, meaning that there are no longer any ferns available in the swamp. If it's a 12, the same thing happens, except for the trees are set to zero on swamps. After the current player has rolled their dice, they're going to be able to move any of their dinosaurs on the board. So let's say that it's currently the red player's turn. They're going to be able to move their dinosaurs based on the speed value on that dinosaur. For example, Example, this one has a speed of two. So they can move this dinosaur across two spaces on the board, across two borders. But they're always going to have to move across terrain types that they can survive in, and they must end in a terrain type that they survive in. And after they've moved, they're going to be able to perform up to three different types of actions. The first is that they may feed their dinosaurs using the resources on the spaces or adjacent to the spaces where they're located. They can use any plant type resources on spaces or next to spaces where they currently stand, and they may use any kill or carcass uh, resources on spaces where they currently are. Now at the beginning of the game there are no kill or carcass resources, so right now you're going to be worried about feeding dinosaurs who feed on plants. They would simply adjust the markers for as much food as they need based on their food indicator on their dinosaur piece. 
So for example, this dinosaur here requires three food of either ferns or trees, and you would adjust the markers appropriately. Once you have done so, you would turn the marker on the tile to show that that dinosaur has been fed. The other things you can do on your turn are to hunt, and in order to hunt you would have to end on a spot with a dinosaur that you may attack. Dinosaurs that hunt have the red food indicator, so for example this dinosaur requires one kill in order to survive at the end of the turn. If that dinosaur were to end on a space with another dinosaur, it could attack that dinosaur in order to attempt to kill it. But the defending dinosaur has a choice as to whether or not they want to fight or run, and they're going to base this on the F values on the dinosaur. So for example, this one has a fight of two, while the dinosaur it's attacking has a fight of five. So the attacking dinosaur would roll a die and look at their value. They got a six, and they would add that to their fight value, which is a total of eight. Where the defending dinosaur would also roll a die, and it also got a six, adding it to a five for an eleven. In this case, the de defending dinosaur would kill the attacking dinosaur, which would be removed from the board. And a number of kill counters would be added equal to the dinosaur's food number times three. So three kill counters would go onto this board. And that would be represented on a kill counter track. Rather than fighting, the defender could have fled instead, and in this case they would use the speed values on their cards. So for example, the defender has a speed of 1, while the attacker has a speed of 2. What would happen here is that each of them would roll a die, and they would add these values based on what they roll. So for example, the, let's say the attacker rolled a 4 and the defender rolled a 1. The defender's going to have negative 1, or the attacker's actually going to have plus 1, to their speed value for this turn. So if we look at the speed values, now the attacker's speed value is 3, while the defender's speed value is still 1. And in this case, the attacker would be able to kill the defender before he got away. But if the defender had an equal or higher speed value, he'd be able to simply move to an adjacent square and be safe from attack on this turn. In addition to feeding, moving, and hunting, dinosaurs can also breed with other dinosaurs of like types. For example, on this forest back here, we happen to have two oviraptors. This is actually a swamp. On this swamp back here, we have two oviraptors. And they can breed with each other as long as both of the controlling players agree so. Now, these are both controlled by Green, so of course he's going to agree to allow them to breed. And when they breed, they're going to roll dice. In the case of one player breeding their animals, you're going to roll one die. And dependent on what the value is, in this case it's a four, I would get one egg. If it was a five or a six, I would add two eggs. Now, I'm going to take an egg marker, which are little white tokens, and I'm going to add it next to my dinosaur. As long as there is still a dinosaur there protecting that egg at the end of the turn, it will turn into a new overwrapper, which is going to give me points for the end of the game scoring and give me more dinosaurs to move throughout the board. If I choose to breed with another player's dinosaur, they must first accept. So for example, if this was a yellow dinosaur, instead of a green one, they must choose to accept. In that case, I'm going to roll two dice, or each player is going to roll one die, and we're going to add the values together. In the case of a seven or a low number, you're going to get only one egg per player. But if it was an eight or higher, you'd get two eggs per player, and they would both hatch into new dinosaurs, as long as a dinosaur was there to protect them by the end of the turn. After the first player has finished all of their actions, you're going to go to the next player, who is going to perform the same series of events, rolling the two dice to see which space will provide more food, then going through all of their player actions of movement, feeding, hunting, and all of that, and then you're going to go all the way through until all players have done this. At the end, you're going to go through, and you're going to perform what's called the end phase step by step. Uh, at this point, any player that wasn't able to feed any of their dinosaurs previously has one last chance to feed any dinosaurs that haven't been fed. After this, you're going to look and see if any of these spaces have kill counters on them left over. If so, all of these are going to trade to car or change to carcasses, which will be a symbolism of them rotting away, and will be available for a more scavenger type of dinosaur to take advantage of later. Then you're going to take all of the kills and set them to zero, so kills no longer exist because they've rotted into carcasses. Hungry dinosaurs at this point will die, and any dinosaur that hasn't been fed is considered to be hungry. So if a hungry dinosaur dies, it's going to create an amount of carcass counters equal to 3 times its food size. So in this case, 9 carcass counters would be available if this dinosaur were to die, and would get placed onto the square 
or the triangle indicating that the dinosaur has died and the dinosaur would be removed from the board. After you've gone through and taken care of any hungry dinosaurs, you're going to look for unattended eggs on the board. Since all of our eggs are attended, or our only egg is attended, it's not going to be removed. But any egg that does not have a dinosaur of its main type next to it is going to be removed from the board and create a carcass counter for that spot. Finally, we're going to hatch all attended eggs. So for example, this egg here, which was from an oviraptor, would produce a new oviraptor on the board, which is going to be a point for that player and another dinosaur that they can move around. Finally on a turn, a player is going to have the chance to one, score points, you're going to count up all of the dinosaurs that they have on the board and all of their point values and score it on this score track here, which will keep track of how many points each player has. And then they're going to have a chance to take one of four improvements, which is simply going to be either to get dinosaurs, more dinosaurs to place on the board, more eggs to place on the board, or some cards that they may get which will give them special effects throughout the game. These effects will affect different aspects of the game, such as giving more eggs, adding or removing food from the board, giving new dinosaurs, or various other effects which can somehow benefit you or be a detriment to your opponent. The game will continue until one player manages to have 40 points at the end of these phases. Alright, so that's Age of Dinosaurs. And I have to say, while I love the theme, I think the game might be a little too fiddly. Um, I wasn't huge on the gameplay. It has a very Settlers of Catan type of mechanism for generating resources. Um, the area control and the breeding work very well, uh, and the theme is great. Uh, another theme that's going to be very good for younger children, or just for people who love dinosaurs. Uh, but I think that the game needs a little bit more development in terms of the board space. Uh, it's a little, little hard to manage all of those little tokens, especially given that some of the tokens fall uh, on a spot that needs to hold two tokens sometimes, and that the tokens are perhaps a little bit too big for the board. Other than that, the mechanics work well. It's just not a game that I myself found particularly exciting. So if you're into area control type games, or you're into games where you're breeding a species of dinosaur or multiple species of dinosaurs, you're trying to control resources, and then you're trying to just best get yourself raced to 40 points, you might like Age of Dinosaurs, but it just definitely wasn't a title that was for me. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.